and uh, said that everywhere he went, he wanted to tell everybody about how he had escaped from that flood, and he always just cornered anybody he could, anywhere he could, to share that news. But one day the man died, and he went to heaven, and there in heaven he would go to all the testimony meetings, and, and he kept asking Peter to put him on the program. He wanted to share his testimony of how he'd escaped from the flood at Johnstown. And so after much pestering, one day Peter came to him and said, all right, we're going to put you on the program today. Uh, you'll come right after Noah. <laughs> and brother and sister, that's the way I feel up here today. Uh, when you hear me and like Ron Dunn preach and you hear Paul Seeker and Jimmy Robertson and these fellows preach, uh, that's about the way I feel. I told some of them last night, Brother Jimmy didn't ask me if I wanted to preach. He come and said, uh, uh, you're preaching tomorrow. And uh, I told some of the ones that were with me from my church and my wife, I said, I feel like I've gone into a restaurant to sit down and eat, and they've told me I had to cook the food. But, uh, but you know, the Lord uh, did. And I honest, before God, I didn't come here this week uh, even really thinking about uh, preaching. I mean, you know, always in the back of your mind there's that thought because of the way Brother Jimmy, you know, just says, hey, you're preaching. And I've seen that happen to a lot of other fellows. But I really didn't come here even anticipating preaching except that vague thing in the back of my mind. And so uh, when he said that, I began to know immediately. And I began to get a little uh, scary feeling yesterday, so I really began to dig into some things God had been saying to my heart. And a message he laid on my heart, and it'll be the first time I've tried to preach this message because God just laid it on my heart. And I, I almost wanted to tell Jimmy to just go ahead and let me preach this morning when the Calvary Singers got through singing because they were talking about the Word of God. And then Jimmy shared his heart with us as to how the need is in getting the Word of God out. And uh, what I want you to do at this time is to turn with me in, in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8. And I want to talk to us today from this passage uh, on the Word of God, but basically I guess the title would be A Revival at the Watergate. You know, we hear a lot about Watergate, and uh, well, we're not hearing as much now as we used to hear about it, but as I thought about this, I thought we know more about the Watergate of Washington than we know about the Watergate in the Word of God. And it's a shame that we know so much about everything else and we know so little about the Word of God. Now you go ahead and get turned there because I, I want to say while I'm up here because I don't know where I'll ever be back up here again or not, so I'll go ahead and say it while I'm up here. And, uh, but uh, I really appreciate this place. I, I could have drove 30 miles and, and listened to some preaching this week in an evangelism conference in our state. Uh, but uh, going and listening to preaching is not what it's all about. And the Lord's blessed me in coming here, and, and uh, this conference this week's been the best one I've been in yet. I said that last February, and it was the best one at that time. But God, it's like Ron said earlier this week, you keep letting the bucket down, but it never hits bottom. You just dig a little deeper and a little deeper. And that's really the way it's been. And uh, God has really, uh, he's, I need to go on home, just to be honest with you, because I've already got more than I know what to do with. I really have. I don't know how I'm going to get all these things working in my life. But I appreciate this place. I appreciate Brother Jimmy Robertson and uh, his stand. I appreciate uh, the way God uses him. Brother Paul Sika has meant so much to me in his ministry. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think accidents happen, but as he, sh as he shared a while ago how he first came to be with us in a meeting, and uh, he's been with us every year since then uh, because God has so anointed that to be. And God has blessed in those times, and I've really come to appreciate him and Jerry and, and these people. And, and, you know, it's just like one big family here. And I've met other people, and I look out... Uh, there and I, and I know a lot of you by faith. Some of you I can't call your names, but God has really blessed and drawn some people together here that are dear to our hearts, and I really, I'm thrilled to be a part of what's happening at Mealdale. I really am. Let's look together now at this passage in Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, 
both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And then it tells some that stood beside him. But down in verse 5 it says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Joshua, and it goes on and names some other people that are there with him. And it, in the latter part, caught, that says, The Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place, or they remained in their place. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, which is governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stealed all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. May we pray together. Our Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you'd take this portion of your precious word and anoint it for this time. Anoint the ears of the hearers, anoint the lips of the messenger, and may God, your perfect will, be accomplished. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, you get into a passage of Scripture sometimes and you can't get away from it, and then you pray about it and, and uh, you're looking for what God really wants. And, and the one thing that I'd rather do at this time than anything I know is to make sure that I bring the message that God wants for this time. And I believe with all my heart, I believe this morning that God confirmed this message to my heart because of the very fact of the things that happened here uh, this morning concerning the Word of God. And uh, I see this picture of a revival taking place at the Watergate. And what has happened is they have found the book of the law. These people have returned from captivity, built the walls back of their city. And in this period of time, as they... Uh, have found the, the book of the law. It says in that first verse that all the people united together called for the book of the law to be brought and to be read to them. They had a desire, and that's my first point if you want it, the desire for the Word of God. They had a desire for the Word of God. And you know, revival begins when people get a desire for the Word of God. Now, I'm not talking about just a desire for the Word of God to say, read the Word of God. It's obeying the Word of God. Now, we'll move through to that, but the first, it starts with a desire for the Word of God. These people said, bring the book and read it to us. There was a desire. They wanted the Word of God. And until you and I get to the point to where we desire for the Word of God, desire that the Word of God be brought to us, then there's not going to be that movement of spiritual awakening in our land. You see, we talk a lot about it, we talk about the Bible. We sing about the Bible. But it's, I go to a lot of meetings. I don't know how it is here, but in, in South Carolina, especially in Greenville, where I'm at, I go to associational meetings. I go to, to conferences where there's going to be preaching of the Word, and I look around me, and I don't see a half a dozen out of 300 or 400 preachers with a Bible. They may have a little testament stuck in their pocket, and that's fine, but you need the Word of God. I mean... You know, Paul said he went over uh, to uh, Berea preaching. You know, he was persecuted everywhere he went. He had left one town and he went on down to Berea. And he said those people were more noble than the others because they listened and then they searched the Scriptures to make sure that what Paul was preaching was the truth of the Word of God. 
And I've got confidence in the men that's, that stand in this pulpit this week. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to take their word for it. I'm going to check the book. I don't care. I mean, I love, I love to hear Ron Dunn. I say that I believe he's the greatest preacher there is alive today, and I believe that without any question. But I'm going to check the word even when Brother Ron preaches because God wants me to search the Scriptures. And, and that desire for the Word, that desire that says I must have the Word of God, I must have it today, I, I, I can't do without it. I've got to get this book and I've got to search it. I've got to see what's in it for me. Amen. And that's what these people wanted. They wanted the Word of God. There was a unified desire on the part of those people to hear the Word of God. And uh, over in the book of Psalms, the 119th Psalm and the uh, verse 72, it says that there was such a desire on their part for the Word of God that it was more precious to them than the silver and the gold. You know, I thought about what Brother Jimmy said today in his message about his home, that though we have to have a place to live, but he said, I couldn't get by on something less. My friend, that's a man who's got a heart for what the Word of God teaches. That's what he's saying. He said, I, I love the Lord and His Word so much, and and I, I'm, I'm desirous to please the Lord. I'm desirous to do His will. And I can live in a shanty if necessary that the gospel is preached to those people that want to hear. Now, that's what I heard him say. You might have heard something different. But I believe that's what he was saying. He had a desire for the Word of God to be pleasing before the Lord. And these people said, it's more precious than gold and silver. Old Job said uh, a beautiful thing about it. He said, more precious than, and more needful to him than his own food for his substance, for just getting him by. He said, the Word of God is more needful to me than food that I eat. Now, do you have that kind of desire for the Word of God? I mean, when they come in here and holler and say, okay, it's, it's on the table. Well, I tell you, you better watch out or you'll get run over getting over the dining hall. But I don't see that kind of effort to get into the Word of God. Maybe to get into a preaching service sometime, there's a, there's a rush. But to get into the Word of God. Now, maybe I'm different, but I find it difficult sometimes to find that little bit of time that I need to get along with God and His Word. Now, friend, listen, God speaks through His Word. It's through the Word of God that God speaks to our hearts. We need to hear the Word of God. And these people had a desire. Now, think about those people in Mexico. I've never been there but just throwing little tracks out, little portions of the Word, and they get all excited and are willing to fight for just that little bit. That's a desire for the Word of God. That's the kind of desire that God wants us to have for the Word of God. That's the kind of desire for the Word of God that will bring revival. It's the kind of desire that says, I've got to have it. It's more important to me than anything else. And my friends, I'm telling you that in, in Amos' writing, he says there's coming a famine in the last days, and it's not a famine for food and drink, but it's a famine of the Word of God. Amen. And I'm tired, one person, I'm tired of hearing people tell me what they think about the Word of God, now what they think about this thing or that thing. I want to know what thus saith the Lord. Amen. I want to know what the Word of God says. And so there needs to be a real desire. Now, I'll tell you, I can tell you that these people had a desire. You just look down uh, in verse 3, and it says, He read therein before the street was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Brother, when the sun was coming up, when the sun was getting up there so they could see the book, he started reading. And those people stayed with him to midday. And it says they were attentive down in the light. They were attentive to the Word of God. They were listening to what he said. They were desirous for the Word of God. I don't know what God's going to have to do in your life and mine to get us hungry for the Word of God. But I believe the Word of God, and I believe that what Amos was prophesying is fast upon us. Desire for the Word of God. That's where it starts, a desire for the Word of God. These people had a desire. But then there also has to be a devotion to the Word of God. When people have a desire for the Word of God, notice down in verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. He's standing up on the podium, and, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. He didn't tell them to stand up. There's no indication that he even had to tell them to stand up. But when he started reading the Word of God, there was such a reverence. Those people... There, they were filled with, I believe with all my heart, with the holy awe, the sensation that this is God's Word, God speaking. You see, when I read the Scriptures, it's more important than anything else I say. 
The whole time I'm up here, I can't say anything that's more important than just simply reading the Word of God. Because when the Word of God is read, that's God speaking. And when God began to speak through Ezra, these people rose to their feet in reverence to God. They stood up. That's the kind of reverence you and I need to have for the Word of God. We need to respect the Word of God. Not only did they stand up, but you'll see that he goes on and he says that they, when Ezra began to bless the Lord, that all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. They lifted their hands. What's that, a sign? That's praise. That's adoration to God. They had a praise, an adoration to the Word of God because it represents God speaking. They raised those hands before God. And then he goes on and says, They bowed their heads, worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, the only way I know you can get your face to the ground is get flat on your stomach. That's the only way I know you can put your face to the ground. And I believe these people had had such a reverence for the Word of God had lifted their hands and, and agreed with the, with the blessing to the Lord, and they got on their faces before God and, and worshipped Him, worshipped Him, because the Word of God, God was with them. God had drawn nigh to these people. We can sing drawn nigh to God. God drew nigh to these people because they, they had reverenced the Word of God. Then the next thing that I see in this passage of Scripture is a dividing of the Word of God. Notice it, it goes on in verses 7. And following, the men here that stood with him, and this might be something like our Sunday school today, some people assisting the pastor as he preaches, and then they go into separate little groups. It seems to have that idea that they went into separate little groups, and uh, they explained it to them. They, they broke it down for them because it says that these people stood in their place, and verse 8 says they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, distinctly, plainly, Plainly they read in the book and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Yeah, I heard J. Harold Smith one time in a meeting and he said, Brothers, the Lord said, Feed my sheep, not my giraffes. Put it down where the people can get it. I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten what J. Harold Smith said. He said, Put it down there where sheep can get it. That old giraffe with that long neck can reach up. But you see, my congregation of people, they're not all able to reach way up and get it. You've got to put it down. Matter of fact, they, they don't have a pastor that can put it up there. I can't reach up there. But you see, we are called to feed sheep. Put it down where they can get it. And you see what happens when people understand the Word of God and these people were understanding it because it was put where they could get it. It was broken down. It was expounded. And I think that's what real preaching is, taking the Word of God just digging into it, seeing what it says, and going before that congregation saying, this is what the Word of God says. And let God, the Holy Spirit, make the application to individual hearts according to what the Word of God says. Instead of you trying to get up or me trying to get up and pump people and, and, and trying to pr promote people to serving God, just give them the Word of God, show them what thus saith the Lord, and let the Holy Spirit do the work. Amen. That's what it's all about. And that's what they were doing here. Now, friend, you see a revival break out because these people took the Word of God, broke it down where the people could get it, where they could see it, where they could understand it, and when they did, it produced repentance. Just breaking the Word of God down, just getting it where people could see it. It says they wept over it. They were weeping, mourning. They were grieved because the Word of God had smote their heart. I tell you, when Brother Jimmy got through this morning and then Paul came and, and just put the icing on that cake, I was broken. I was broken like I can't even explain, but it was just a brokenness before a holy God. And, and you can see yourself just by the sharing of the Word of God how, how far we miss what God's got for us. And so they broke the Word of God out. These people begin to weep. They begin to mourn. And you know what happens then? Just look at what it, Not only does it produce repentance, but it promotes rejoicing. You see, Nehemiah is smart. Nehemiah comes on the scene and he says, listen, uh, you're going to have to mourn not. Verse 9, see, he says, mourn not nor weep. The people were weeping because they'd heard the words of the law, but he said, don't mourn. Now, you know, a lot of times I tell people, now look, what we need to do is get on our face before God and, and we, need to, we need to be grieved, and we do. But we can't stay on our face grieving because, you see, 
He says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Now, friend, you're not going to get many people to get right with God. You're not going to get p many people walking in the holiness of the Lord down grieving. I mean, brother, we've got to grieve before God when we see our wickedness, but we've got to realize what the Lord Jesus has done for us, and we've got to move into the walk of the Lord Jesus and rejoice in Him. Amen. You see, our rejoicing's in the Lord. If I had to rejoice in my circumstances or in my feelings, I never would rejoice. But rejoicing in the Lord, you can rejoice regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the condition you're walking in. And that's exactly what Nehemiah is saying to these people. Look, if God is alive, if God is the God of this book and, and he's smote our hearts and we're broken, then we need to move on to the next stage of this game and start rejoicing in the Lord so that people know our God's alive. Amen. People need to know our God's alive. And they'll know it when there's strength because of joy. You know, if you see somebody, if you see somebody that can rejoice, they've got problems, They've got circumstances that just seem unbearable. But right in the midst of it, I don't mean they're laughing like some kind of idiot. I mean, I mean they're grieved because of their circumstances. But right in the midst, there's a joy, and you can see it, and you know it, and it's real. You see, that does something to me. When I see pe people react with joy in troublesome times, in trials, I know that they're with the Lord. They're with Him. They're walking with Him. He's with them. The joy of the Lord is your strength. We need to know. You know, Brother Paul used that passage in Hebrews 12 today where it says that because of the joy, he was willing to suffer the shame. You see, after the shame comes the joy. After the weeping comes joy. Too many Christians I know are still in the sad part. They're in, they're in the weeping stages, but they never get to the joy stage. Amen. Now, we need both of it, but there will be repentance when the Word of God is shared like it ought to be shared. There will be repentance. There will be weeping. There will be mourning. There'll be grieving. But if it's real, true, godly repentance, there'll come rejoicing. There'll come rejoicing. It'll follow it always. And when we have seen the Word of God divided and bring about this kind of situation, there'll be a dedication to the Word of God. A dedication to the Word of God. Notice verse 12. All the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because... They had understood the words that were declared unto them. They had understood. Now, you see, there was a dedication. It's not enough. And here's where most of us stop. You see, we, we can rejoice. We can get excited. We can shout a little bit. We can sing. And we can praise. And we can go through some things. But until we come to this part of the dedication to the Word of God, and what, what I'm saying here is there was such a dedication to the Word of God, it produces some things in their lives. And first of all, it produced service in their lives. Notice it, that in verse 10, when Nehemiah said to them to, to start rejoicing, he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. Send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. What's he talking about? In verse 12, you see them doing what he told them to do in verse 10. Go and send portions to them that don't have. It'll produce that kind of service. You see, if, if the Word of God has really come to my heart, I'm going to take some action, and there's going to be something done about it. I can be challenged as I was this morning that there is a need for the Word of God to be put into the hands of those people who do not have the Word of God. There's a need for it, but unless I'm willing to take that message and listen to the Word of God and do something about it, then it's useless. I mean, Jimmy may as well just have stayed at home this morning. Paul might just as well have stayed home. I might just as well not be here now unless we're going to get obedient to the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is directing us to do something. We've got to be something before we can do something. But when we are something, we're going to do something. And these people went home and they did something. Now, it says they sent portions to them. Now, you know, the Lord's given us a good portion this week. Man, he has blessed us. There's not anybody in this conference that couldn't walk over in the bookstore and, and, and buy a copy of God's Word if you wanted it. There's not anybody here that couldn't purchase a copy of God's Word. Anybody could do that this week. But yet there are people that we've been told about that they don't have it, they have no means of getting it. And unless some people that have been blessed and really believe that the Word of God is what it says 
unless we come to the fact of believing it, then those people will never have a copy of it because, my friend, it's going to be up to you and me to get this Word of God to these people. It's going to be up to us. And here was a revival that broke out when the Word of God was broken down to these people because they heard it and they said, we'll do what we're told to do. And they sent, they sent those portions to the others. In verse 13, it says that on the second day they were gathered together and the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, went unto Ezra the scribe even to understand the words of the law. Now, if you read that in the New American Standard, it, it sounds just a little bit better. Where it just, what it amounts to is these people had been so fed with the Word of God that they went back searching for more. You know, what they were searching for is what you and I ought to be searching for. They were searching for the Lord so they'd know what to do. You see, when they got into the Word of God, it goes on in the next verses to tell us that they saw what the Word of God had said about these setting up booths and being there in that area worshiping God. And so they began to go out and pick up sticks like the Word of God said. You know, these people believed the Word of God. And if the Word of God said it, they did it. I mean, I'm sure they felt like they were just a bunch of fools out running around picking up sticks. You've got to remember these people had not been under the law of God. They, I mean, they didn't understand. They had not heard the Word of God read like this. And when they had heard it read, and they said, well, hey, that's in the Word of God. The Bible says that. If the Bible says that, it must be true, so let's do it. Vance Havner says, don't lose the wonder. He talks about new Christians. You know, when you get saved, the only thing you know is that you've got a Bible. It's, you've been told it's the Word of God. Every word of it is the truth, and all you've got to do is obey it. And a new Christian will just start taking the Word of God, and if it says it, they go out and they do it. And then they're in our churches for a little while, and they see nobody else doing it, and so they say, well, that must not be true. Uh, that must not mean what it says, you know. And we start trying to to do different things about it. We're trying to explain away the Word of God. But new Christians, they believe the Word of God, and that's exactly what happened to these people. They saw it in the Word, and when they saw it in the Word, they went out and started picking up sticks and started making booze, and they started worshiping God like the Bible said to do it. Now, you and I, we can talk about it, but we don't do much about it. You see that last thing there is just simple obedience. God says obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better to obey than to give sacrifice. Better to obey than to give sacrifice. Now, there was a little girl, I, and her dad and a little brother. They was, I believe the little girl was about 10 years old. The little boy was eight. Their father, they were all out at the beach, and they'd gone into the water and was swimming around, and all of them could swim. The little girl was a pretty good swimmer, and the dad, the little boy, was not too good a swimmer, but they'd gotten out, and the current had begun to pull them out. That tide was just pulling them on out. And, and before they realized that they were out so far and, and they weren't able to, to get back in, and so the, the father said to the little girl, he said, Now, honey, I'm going to take your brother and I'm going to try to swim in to shore. I said, You can float on your back all day. I said, You can float, you can swim a little bit, and you can float on your back. I said, You can float on your back all day. I said, Now I'm going to get help. I said, You just stay out here and you just float on your back and I'll be back. I'll be back for you. And so he began to swim, and, and finally he made it into shore with his little boy, and he told the people what had happened, and they began to go out in boats, and swimmers went out. Everybody was just uh, beginning to search for that little girl out there. And I believe it was about four or five hours that they were out in that water searching. And finally, there she was floating along on her back. And they got to that little girl, and uh, they got her into the boat. And when they got her into the boat, they said, Honey, wasn't you afraid? And she said, No, I wasn't afraid. He said, my daddy told me that I could float on my back all day. And he told me he'd be back for me. And I just believed my daddy would be back. I knew he would be back. Now, I'm, I'm using that to close today because I want you to see something. I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, the first chapter. You've heard this verse a lot lately. But I want you to see something. I want you to see something about the Word of God. Acts 1, verse 8, beginning there. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus is, is just preparing right now. He's fixing to ascend back to heaven. And the very last thing he says to these men that had walked with him was that when the Holy Spirit has come, you're to be witnesses unto me because you'll receive the power to be witnesses. Power to witness. A lot of people are trying to find the power for a lot of things, but he says the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon your life is to make you a witness. Amen. To make you a witness. 
And that's what the Word of God says, that we're to be made witnesses. Now, down in verse 11, the apostles had stood around a while and looking, they were gazing, says, which...